Hi, and welcome to the SAP Speaker Series hosted by HANA House, our second virtual edition today. Um, my name is Daniel Zimmer. I'm the general manager for our HANA House locations in Palo Alto and in Newport Beach. Newport Beach is the one that you see behind me, um, where we again, like last time, um, shown some pictures um, from HANA House in the background of our speakers today. And I couldn't be more excited uh, then welcoming you today for this amazing panel that we have planned, uh, hosted by Ryan Phillips from SAPIO, hosting um, Humera and uh, Leticia from uh, the Stanford D School, um, and uh, talking about um, the next generation of higher education. Super excited about that, um, and I'm excited about the questions and the feedback that you will submit today during the call. Um, a little bit of uh, background on the HANA House Speaker Series. As you all know, we usually host these events in person um, at um, our HANA House locations. But of course, due to the uh, current situation, we shift to a virtual format and open it up to a global audience. So um, what is really amazing about that is that we have people from all around the world um, dialing in and um, for our monthly events. And we, we want to make sure that we do this in the future as well. So stay tuned for more um, HANA House and SAP virtual speaker series events and um, have a lot of fun today with the panel that I'm uh, introducing now. Ryan, why don't you take it from here? Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and welcome, everyone. I know we have tons and tons of guests online, and I'm so excited to, to share with you two of my best friends and two of the most inspiring people that I've ever had the opportunity to work with. And, and I, I hope over the next hour that you'll get to see some of that as well. Um, so today we've got uh, Humera Fasihuddin here with us, as well as Leticia Britos Cavagnara. Um, they are the two co-directors of the University Innovation Fellows. And you know, instead of giving a long, long introduction today, um, you know, I want you to hear from from them as much as possible because they're incredibly inspiring. Um, so over the time, you know, like Daniel mentioned, please submit your questions. Um, we'll save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end to make sure that we get to, to all those questions and, um, and answer what you want to hear about. But to get started, um, and, and before we jump into the University Innovation Fellows, um, Humer and Leticia, uh, you know, love to learn a little bit about, about you all. Um, so, you know, uh, may, maybe let's start out with a quick introduction and then, and then we, can, we can jump in. Great. Thank you. Uh, Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan, uh, Daniel, and the rest of the crew at SAP. Um, Humera Fasiuddin, uh, co-founder and co-director of the Fellows Program. I, um, I live in Massachusetts, actually, 90 minutes from Boston. I live on a farm with lots of farm animals and, and vegetables. I've been socially distancing with my dog and my three kids as co-working inhabitants who, uh, when they're not on Google Classroom, they're uh, playing Call of Duty or Minecraft. And, and uh, yeah, so um, that's a little bit about me. Math major, MBA, uh, uh, and innovation fellows. So hi, everyone. My name is Leticia, as Ryan mentioned. Uh, I am here sheltering in place in San Francisco in the beautiful uh, neighborhood of the marina. It's sunny here. I live here with my husband, um, and I've been living here in California for the past 16 years, but uh, I was born in Uruguay, a tiny, tiny country that is half the size of California, and is in the south, south of South America, um, and that's where my all of my family, except for my husband, uh, are still are. Uh, but I came to um, the U.S. Uh, to pursue my uh, grad uh, studies uh, in developmental biology, and I never left. So here I am uh, uh, at some point, and that's kind of like a long story. I transitioned to from the world of uh, experimental biology to the world of design and education, um, and that's where um, I uh, met Humera, and that's where like the, the program uh, got started and we uh, co-founded uh, this program that now has grown uh, to um, you know, have the impact that it has. So it's great to be here and, and tell you a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, as the audience can see, you two clearly have uh, amazing backgrounds that are incredibly varied, right? I mean, thinking about a PhD in biology, you know, studies in math and, and MBA, 
you know, and then somehow ending up sort of in education, right? Um, and this is a question to both of you. What, what has been sort of the most important learning you all have had when, you know, transitioning between these incredibly different fields? Well, for me, um, you know, with a, a math degree, I entered into industry in a recession, much like today's students are finding themselves without opportunity. I had no idea how I was going to put that math degree to work. Um, and I, uh, I, I tried a lot of different things. I, I sold uh, uh, goods for some uh, organizations. I worked in an office setting. I, I found myself in the manufacturing sector at the very uh, bottom of a, the manufacturing pyramid, if you will, um, and work my way up uh, over the course of seven years. They paid for my MBA. I became a product manager. Um, and I, I learned a lot. But I have to say uh, that the entry was not smooth. And for me, uh, what became clear through the many experiences that I had is that we could, do, we could be doing so much better to prepare students for their entry into the workforce. And that, and that preparation needs to start at their, during their college days. Uh, they, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be, um, it can't be incumbent upon the company to get them ready. And, um, and those beginner level jobs that used to be in place in the 50s and 60s and 70s where there were training programs and, and um, you know, that, those are gone. And so what can we do in the university setting to get students thinking um, and, and acting in ways that get them ready to hit the ground running when they enter their careers? <laughs> Sorry, Molly is agreeing. <laughs> so uh, for me, um, so for moving countries and, and by the way, like coming from uh, Uruguay to the US was not the first time that I moved to a different country when I was five. Uh, uh, my family moved to Colombia and that's where I grew up. Uh, but uh, from moving countries to uh, changing from biology to education, I've been changing worlds a lot. And one thing that I really um, come to appreciate and really value is my role as an outsider, as a newcomer and really embracing that. Um, and what I mean by that is that oftentimes we feel that we need to um, accumulate lots of experience and expertise uh, in a given discipline before we can contribute anything worthwhile. Uh, and I think that's like really, um, you know, uh, wasting something that is invaluable. And that is your fresh eyes, your fresh perspective, the, the ability to ask the questions uh, in a field that the experts perhaps like are not uh, know too much uh, to ask anymore. Uh, so you can cross pollinate, you can bring new methods and you can point to different ways of working. So really embracing your status as an as a, um, outsider, as a newcomer. I love that. I love that. And this is something we tell every new intern that comes into our team, every new hire ev at every level. It's, we say, you know, take your first six weeks and please uh, ask the stupid questions. Um, and, and what we find is that Actually, the people who learn more in that process are the people who have been there for five, 10, 15 years, um, because oftentimes they you know, never thought to ask that question or they had been there so long um, that they just you know, felt embarrassed to ask it. So, so I love that view of being, being an outsider. Um, so before we jump into UIF, maybe uh, you know, would love to hear like you know, in your words, because I could give, give my view, but would love to hear like, you know, in one or two sentences, what is the University Innovation Fellows? Kumara, do you want to take a stab or I'm happy to? Happy to do it. Um, so in one or two words, University Innovation Fellows Program is creating student system thinkers who partner with their institutional leaders, presidents and deans and, and professors, to imagine new possibilities at school. So they're, I know I'm beyond one or two words, but they're using their entrepreneurial mindset. They're using tools of innovation and entrepreneurship design and creativity to imagine more effective means to expose 
hundreds, if not thousands of other students to uh, this kind of thinking and this kind of framework while they're at school. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Um, and I think I want to hone in on one thing as we dig in here. You mentioned students. You're, you're equipping students as, as the change makers, right? And I know that, you know, I was a university innovation fellow myself and, and learned a ton of exactly what you mentioned. Um, but, you know, the, the UIF program was one of only three programs or one of three programs that was funded by the National Science Foundation uh, almost 10 years ago now. Um, to drive change in, in education, right? One was, you know, equipping students, the UIF program. One was, you know, equipping, uh, you know, uh, change through through professors and, and leaders in the university. And then the third was, was more academic research focused. Um, why in your mind did did the UIF program take off by by equipping students? That feels a little a little backwards in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of a uh, uh, broader context, uh, so this was uh, an NSF grant that was given to uh, a unit at Stanford, the hub for uh, entrepreneurship education in the engineering school, the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, uh, with the mandate of uh, supporting entrepreneurship and, and innovation education uh, for uh, undergraduate engineering students uh, nationwide, right? Like so. Uh, a very uh, ambitious goal, um, and uh, I was part of, of the, the team that got that center uh, off the ground, um, and, and we started thinking about, like, what are, the, when are, what are our strategies? And, and of course, like, as you mentioned, uh, the, the, you know, the more traditional and more expected strategies is to work with leaders, to work with the deans, to work with the university presidents, to work with the faculty, the engineering faculty. Um, so, and we did all of that, right? Like, so we organized conferences um, and of course we had a, a component of research that allowed us to synthesize all of that, the things that we were learning and, and, and sharing that and sharing those bigger learnings. Um, and then uh, we had this sort of like crazy idea. What if we engage the students to uh, be the, the, cha the change agents who help bring innovation and entrepreneurship to their schools? Um, and, you know, uh, we have to, I have to say that th this idea was not uh, enthusiastically received, uh, might be an understatement. Um, and, and, you know, probably for a good reason, because if you think about it, like, and, and the arguments that we were getting from even our, our um, the, the folks working with us in the center, were that students uh, were, you know, they're just passing by, right? Like, they're, they're, they're going to graduate. They're just passing by. Um, they're not part of the, the institution in a, in a permanent way. So how can they create any lasting change, right? Um, and, and, you know, Homer and I said, well, you know what? We're, we're just going to try. We're just going to try and see what happens. And fast forward, uh, you know, a, a few years, uh, the grant ended, the NSF money ran out. Um, and instead of you know, our, uh, and, and the, the, uh, the most of the NSF projects uh, maybe end up in like publications or end up in a report that is submitted, right? Um, out, out of all of the strategies that we deployed as part of the center, uh, the student program, the University Innovation Fellows, what ended up being the University Innovation Fellows was the one that survived the end of the grant and not only survived, it thrived when the grant ended. Um, and um, my hypothesis is that actually those things, those same arguments that people had about why students were not the right candidates are actually the ones that prove why they are. Uh, so think, think about this, you know, the students are not part of the bureaucracy. They're not part of the institution. Therefore, we don't know what's not possible, right? They don't know what's not possible and they're, you know, they, they, they're gonna try things that others might have said like, well, we've tried that before, right? But, you know, perhaps like now is the right time and it works, right? Like, so students uh, have kind of like that healthy disregard for the impossible in that like, you know, newcomer like uh, perspective, but also they're going to graduate, that's true. Therefore, they have the urgency of if they want, they're motivated to change education at their schools, uh, they're going to have the urgency to make it happen. They cannot wait for a committee to be formed and discussed for years on end for something to, 
uh, eventually be done. So when they're equipped with the right tools and an experimental mindset and, and tools of thinking about systems, uh, they can really uh, make a change. They're also the customers of the education system, right? So they can uh, attest and, and speak about their real needs and they can communicate with their peers in ways that often uh, faculty and administrators struggle with. So those are, those are some reasons. Yeah, and, and look, you know, it's it's clear to 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 see that people have a high bar you set for them. So if you set a high bar for a set of students and uh, have a set of expectations and hold them accountable to that and and build in some incentives and rewards for them to rise to that occasion, they will gladly rise to that occasion. And we can think of many instances in our lives and in our ecosystems where there's an abundant resource like students. If you think about numbers of students uh, that, that we could be empowering more people with skills and asking them to rise to the occasion, um, it's, it's transferable to many other areas that, in our lives. I love that. I love that. And, and before we jump there, because I think those skills are going to be awesome, because I think they really tie into to, to how we can impact you know, companies. And, and obviously, these students are going to leave university, like you mentioned. Um, I would love to hear a few examples of, of some of the amazing work that, that students have done. I don't know if you have some, some favorite stories or favorite, favorite uh, changes that have been made um, at different universities that you'd want to share. I, I have a uh, um, a, a few favorite stories. Um, of course, uh, one of them is Ryan, uh, my, uh, of a story at, uh, of a student at University of Oklahoma, um, and that was your story. So uh, I'll, I'll give it in a nutshell, which is that you know you you wanted a, a, an innovation space, and uh, and you found out that lots of different departments on campus were raising funding for their own innovation spaces. And if they had continued down that path, then five, 10 years later, maybe they would have gotten some traction, but you were able to bring them together and they com collectively combined their resources and they were able to achieve traction faster. And, and that's really, I mean, that's, um, it's, it's a remarkable uh, thing. Another is uh, the story of Tanner Whedon at U Utah Valley and uh, Tanner, was also inspired as, as you were by some of the innovation spaces that we have at the D School and at Stanford. And he recognized the opportunity to bring some of those uh, kinds of spaces to Utah Valley, very uh, large and grow fast growing uh, public institution in Utah. And what he, you know, every door he knocked on, he, he got a consistent, you know, answer, great idea, but we'll put it in the five to seven year plan. And you know, he would be graduated and, and uh, long gone if he waited you know, if five to seven years. So he, he took a step back and he said, what do I really actually need space for? It's what happens inside the space that I really wanna inspire. And so he um, put together uh, a cart, a $500 cart of supplies and uh, got permission from his professor who uh, taught a 1500 person gen ed class. He got permission to teach design thinking for two weeks of that course. And, and that just, the students he taught were on fire and so excited. And all the other educators of that gen ed class also wanted to be, learn uh, what Tanner had to, to share. And, and before you know it, he got requests from all over campus to push his cart and, and teach these short workshops that help people uh, exercise their creativity and their innovation mindset. Fast forward a year later, he was invited by the president of the institution to teach a design thinking day long workshop to the cabinet of that, uh, the president's wow. cabinet. And they were uh, just blown away working on projects that were of relevance to the institution. and. Uh, at the end of that day, Tanner got a chance to pitch who he was and what projects he was advancing in his work as a university innovation fellow. And he had offers from five people for space, four of whom had originally said no to him. Now that exemplifies the, the, uh, the way that students have the ability to, uh, you know, to do things within their means and show evidence of uh, the need 
show evidence of the demand uh, that ultimately gets the institution inspired to lend the resources uh, and help you know achieve that institutional change. Uh, I, I, we have so many stories of students all over the nation and globe now that uh, it, it's hard to pick just a couple, but those are you know just a few uh, that that really exemplify students' uh, innovative abilities to get things done. Yeah, and, and I may add, if I may add, uh, the contrast between those two is interesting too, and, and, and the, illustrates a principle that works for our program, which is that uh, the, the goals in both cases for, for you, Ryan, and for Tanner, perhaps were like similar, uh, kind of like creating a, an innovation center, right? But the approaches were very different, right? And kind of like having, uh, equipping the students with that strategic uh, thinking and, and systems thinking of like understanding where they have leverage and where they can find leverage uh, and using different strategies, I think is important. Uh, a couple of other stories that for me kind of like uh, illustrate like the nuance of what fellows do at the, and the, the beauty of like of the of of the strategy. Um, one is uh, uh, Robin Bonatesta, a fellow from Kent State. Um, and she wanted to create like a center for students, a, a space for students to come together and create like uh, uh, you know new things and come up with ideas. You can call it an innovation center. Like the, the, it was a little bit more uh, modest uh, in scope what they wanted. But what I think was interesting is that uh, what uh, she and, and other fellows at Kent uh, found was like they found a space in the library. It was a, a room that was not being used, and they got permission from uh, the dean of the libraries to use that space, right? And so the location is key because it's where all students go regardless of what they're studying. Uh, but also what was really interesting is what they named the space. They called it the fridge, right? And when, you know, talking to them, uh, they have had a very clear reason why. They said, we wanted to avoid all buzzwords. We don't want innovation. We don't want entrepreneurship. We don't want um, hub because we want this to be a place where no student is self-selected out because they have a particular understanding of what innovation is and perhaps they don't feel connected to that or, or they think, well, entrepreneurship is about making money. I'm not you know, on board with that, right? Like, so finding a name that would attract the most students, the most diverse students, right? Um, so, you know, it was like fresh ideas, cool people, the fridge. So that, I think that was uh, beautiful. Another example, uh, Alan Shah uh, from Kettering University, uh, he realized, and sometimes it's not the creation of resources, but the unlocking of resources that already exist. So in this case, um, he, an engineering student, he noticed that um, they had a, like a amazing maker space with all you know, sorts of equipment, uh, but was only being used for a few hours a day by engineering students like him taking very specific classes. So what did he do? He uh, recruited some uh, professors, some uh, uh, other uh, students, and they did open lab days. So they opened the maker space to the community and to students of all disciplines. So they had kids, they had members of the community coming and, and learning how to weld and learning how to be safe using that equipment, right? Like, so understanding that, how do you unlock resources? within your university and beyond, right? Like I'm thinking about the community. So I think those examples also illustrate the, the power of, of uh, empowering students as strategic thinkers. Yeah, I love all of those. And I think there was a common theme there of this. Uh, I think like Leticia, you mentioned this healthy disregard for the impossible, right? Where in many of these cases you had been, you know, students had been told no, or they had been told that's my territory. Um, while you were talking, there was a, a poll question that came up, and I think it's it's amazing because your stories illustrated it so perfectly. So it was, you know, what is the main barrier to creativity in your current workplace? Um, and the top two answers were, you know, being pushed to produce results immediately, um, that quick action, and the you know the the impact of silos, right? This turf war that exists were the top two reasons. Um, and so I thought that would be this would be a great transition because you you hinted at it a bunch in those those stories. But I thought it would be an amazing transition to, to hear a little bit more about the tools and the process that you all use to equip students to go through this. 
Um, because I know it sounds like, I mean, silos and turfs and needing to produce results immediately are, are two things that students face, two problems that students face when, when pushing creativity. So, so I thought that process of, of hearing a little bit more about what, uh, you know, the training and the process UIFs go through would be, would be useful for the audience to hear. Yeah, a, a couple of things that are really important uh, to that is we help the students understand how they may have to, they, you know, we want them to approach their change making um, with an idea towards what would be ideal to have. So they may imagine a new building, a, 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 you know, a new major, uh, you know, big institutional investment related things, um, but they one event or that one, you know, small workshop. And, and so taking a portfolio approach and imagining like an array of strategies helps them, you know, understand like, what can I get started with today? And what can I prototype uh, really, you know, quickly and easily and get uh, some, you know, traction with amongst uh, stakeholders. So we, we have them using the kinds of tools that we use for, you know, design thinking and entrepreneurship of going out and interviewing students and interviewing stakeholders and understanding what is the appetite for this? How can I solve your, uh, the things that keep you up at night, Dean and you know, uh, career development director and entrepreneurship center director so that they're factoring in how can they build uh, interventions that are appealing to students and, and the institution across the board, um, but they're, you know, keeping in mind the long view, right, of what change could look like, but starting with things that are executable and supported uh, really in their early days. We also make sure that they have a one to two year uh, runway. We, we don't want innovation fellows that are seniors. We love them when they're fresh, first years and sophomores because they have a, a, a long road. We know that when they show evidence of progress, when they, they show up and say, I want to do a, a TEDx, or, or I, I want to, you know, create this uh, this uh, new resource for for students. Open Open Foundry Days, like Leticia was saying, that faculty and students are going to be blown away with the action that they did take, and that's going to bring more resources because they're trusted as students who follow through on what their original vision was, and they so in their second year they are able to accomplish that much more. So you know, got to start somewhere. You, you know, you can imagine uh, what utopia looks like, but you've got to start with like some manageable project and have a view towards change that's a long road because that, that progress does take time. It slowly attracts people. A movement doesn't start overnight. So you gotta, you, you gotta take that long view. The other thing is we walk the walk in terms of setting a culture with our own program of uh, you know, students uh, bringing their whole selves, uh, of not necessarily worrying about making themselves look good, but uh, you know, focusing on making others look good. And if you're lifting others up and making others look good, then the, you know, others will make you look good. Um, and and we, we have these community norms that um, we weave into uh, their entire training experience. When we bring them to Silicon Valley, they feel that and they feel a kinship with one another, and they wanna bring that back to their schools. And you know, in high functioning uh, company settings, you have environments where you know, the, the politics and uh, you know, dragging one another down is not okay, right? In, in the really high functioning organizations, you have teams that lift one another up and people that lift one another up. And so we have students experiencing that for the first time in when they come through our program and they want that they, you know, it's not something they're used to in, uh, you know, K-12 or our college having always having, you know, to compete with other students for grades and internships and limited opportunities. And so when they feel um, a more collaborative approach of lifting others up, they want to recreate that at their own schools. And we have to say that, you know, they do a pretty amazing job of infusing that kind of culture, which attracts a lot of students, um, and it is more socially minded. So I would say that that's a, um, a key thing. If we can have students entering into your companies 
right? All of our companies with that mindset, a collaborative approach of lifting others up and not dragging one another down, uh, a, a mindset of abundance, a mindset where, uh, you know, someone else's gain is not your loss, but rather, you know, you, we all benefit, then, then we're going to create cultures of innovation and, and uh, and I think we'll have much better outcomes as a society. That's that's our long game. Yeah, um, I also think that it's um, interesting that there's sometimes a lot of debate about like, well, design thinking or entrepreneurship or lean startup or innovation and what is it and like, can you define it? And 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 I think that's less interesting than allowing for an approach where uh, there's uh, w what makes sense at your institution. Uh, and it might be because of different reasons, right? Like there might be, you know, already a, a center for entrepreneurship and perhaps that's kind of like the place where, you know, it's it, it's poised to like fellows can uh, contribute there and make change. Um, so, and, and we, uh, um, you know, speaking about an entrepreneurial uh, mindset, as Mira said, uh, we walk the walk, right? Like we are an entrepreneurial unit or entrepreneurial unit uh, within Stanford and within the D school, which is something that is is common uh, at the D school, um, and we feel that an important part of this program working is that the institutions themselves have a skin in the game. They participate and they see a value out of the students participating. So there's not only value for the students who are going to learn uh, important skills and mindsets, uh, but there's value for the institutions that see the value of what the fellows create, and there's value for the system because uh, our model is one of social learning, right? The fellows are not learning from us, we are learning together. And together as a community of fellows in different uh, universities, now internationally, we have fellows in over 270 universities in, uh, across the world, uh, and they're learning from one another. They're seeing you know, what works in one place and how can they not exactly do the same and replicate, but like, Oh, this goes at this objective. What makes, how can I get to that? I like to have that objective. How can I make it happen at my university? So they learn from one another as well. And that's, that's an important thing. And I think that it also comes to the, the uh, as Humera said, the norms that we uh, build, weave in into the experience of the fellows, um, create an identity create an identity and that I think it's an important uh, way of creating change is to create, uh, you build your identity as a, as a change agent, right? Like, so, and we say uh, once a fellow, always a fellow. And like you, Ryan, are a perfect example of that, right? Like that you are a fellow, not for, for like, a, you know, a random or like arbitrary period of time as many fellowships are. It's like, oh, you're a fellow for a year and then bye-bye. But like you are a fellow as long as you want to do the work that you know that it's uh, uh, being a fellow right like that you want to contribute whether you are you know still at your university or you have graduated you are working at a company so i think uh that's important uh, and related to that and related to that that communal learning um i think uh one thing that i would call kind of like the first follower principle and probably like you know, people who are, are watching are, are familiar with like the, the Derek Sievers, the dance leadership lessons from the Dancing Guy video. And if you haven't, just like Google leadership lessons, Dancing Guy, and you'll see it's a beautiful example of uh, what, uh, if you want to create a movement and a community of change agents, what you need to do is make the, the, the followers visible. So for us, it's not about making ourselves visible and making what the program and the staff does visible, but making what the fellows do, shining a light on what they're doing. So, so um, for instance, when the fellows who have trained, who have done uh, through the uh, online training and, and are, have been launched as University Innovation Fellows, they come to the Silicon Valley Meetup, um, which is a, a, a fantastic you know, four or five day event or, um, you know, where they get to kind of like meet one another and, and take part in, in amazing uh, activities. Um, but we, we bring, often we bring amazing speakers, right? We've had, and you know, uh, Ryan, you have uh, uh, interviewed some of them, you know, uh, but time and time again, the most uh, popular speakers are 
the fellows, we select a group of fellows from uh, previous cohorts to come help us run the event and tell their stories. And, and those short stories, like four minute stories were, that they tell about the change that they have achieved at their institutions, about the struggles, about their successes, about their, you know, the, what, what they have been through. Those are the most popular um, stories among the, the participants, right? And that's because they see themselves in those fellows, right? They see, wow, that person, that was, th that person was sitting where I am right now. So that could be me in a year. So creating those kind of like proximal role models is important to nurture this community, right? Like, so it, um, that's, that's another aspect of it. And I, I would just uh, close your question by Thing. Uh, this is extremely analogous to our environments in uh, industry that we could start not waiting for top-down sanctioning of uh, an innovation culture, um, but rather we could start by helping our peers in our own teams or across other departments um, by uh, lifting up the kinds of uh, actions and behaviors we want to see, um, you know, calling out others for uh, supporting other other teams, calling out others for great ideas. You know, we don't have to wait for the institution to decide this is going to be rewarded and encouraged. Uh, you know, there is a virtuous cycle that we can start creating in our own institutions where it becomes habit. And, and you know, when you start doing that, people you'll find will lift you up and they, there will be a trust that you create because it's not all about you, right? If you make it about you all the time and if you're not lifting others up, then it is about you. But if you are lifting others up and you're creating a, a more trusting environment, then you, you will find that is, it's an infectious uh, environment of trust uh, and psychological safety, as we like to see amongst uh, teams that are high functioning, um, but you can start today by adopting those very same principles and, and, and telling the stories of people all around you. I love that, I love that. And tying it back, I mean, I know at SAP today, it's our Global Appreciate Day, where our mission today is to share stories. I mean, I think that's a perfect message, right? Of just sharing other stories and making sure that, um, that, that others' achievements are recognized. Um, so I want to make one, one call before I, I'm going to ask a few more questions, but to the audience, please make sure you're submitting your questions and upvoting and downvoting. I already see a ton of amazing stuff in there, um, but I've just got maybe two more questions and then we'll jump over to that, to that audience chat. Um, so one of the things that I, you know, I had this sort of misconception about when I joined UIF was that there was this difference between the creative types, be it the designers or the marketing team um, and the you know, technical or the engineering side of the house, right? The non-creatives. Um, and I think you know, one of my big learnings when I went through the UIF program and, and you know, met you all is, is that you fundamentally don't believe that, um, that, that you and, and your team and, and everyone in the UIF program fundamentally believes that everyone has creativity within them and that we're, we're born with it. So I'd love to hear from you all about why you believe that so strongly and, and maybe some of the tips or tricks that, that you all have um, in your daily life or, or how you've built that with the UIF program. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and, and it's, it's so sad, right? Like what you have mentioned is like, I think one of the greatest crimes that is, you know, perhaps not as evident as other crimes, but it's uh, nonetheless very uh, important uh, in, uh, in um, hindering our ability as civilization, right? Uh, and that, you know, and, and you could think about the, the myth that, you know, that you, you mentioned, I think, or it can be deconstructed in two myths, right? Like one is that is like, you know, yeah, creativity, that's just for the arts, perhaps like in school, it's kind of like, oh, that's the arts in like in corporate is like, okay, that's design and marketing. Those are the creative types. And the other one that you mentioned uh, uh, is believing people who believe I'm not creative. And I believe like some people are born creative and some people are not. Uh, and I just can't think of anything that makes less sense to me, right? Um, and well, I don't know about you, but I'm really enjoying uh, watching The Last Dance, um, uh, the, the story of Michael Jordan. And like, can you believe that he didn't make 
his high school basketball team, right? So even someone like Michael Jordan is like, you know, yeah, of course you're born uh, with um, what you inherit it contributes to your potential, but that's not where it stops, right? He had to kill himself over the summer to make sure that he would make the team, right? Like, so you have to put the work. And we feel that um, schools, unfortunately, do a, a very poor job of equipping students from a very young age, and of course this is a, a generalization so that this is not true of all schools, but the majority um, uh, does not equip them to, uh, with tools uh, and with the belief, right? Uh, the, the, they do not uh, nurture the belief that they can be creative if they put the work. So you have to do the work. Um, so I think the, the fact that, that schools in general have not found good ways of doing this, um, is just uh, something that we, we need to work on. Uh, and that's why we also work with teachers. Uh, but we see at the D school with the fellows that when we uh, empower students with the right tools and with the right environments, uh, you see their creativity is there. It just blossoms, right? Um, so uh, for me personally, and I think you have to, one important thing is like, there's no kind of like cookie cutter recipe that is going to work for everyone, right? But you have to put the work in finding what is it that works for you and in practicing the same way that if you're a basketball player, you would go and do the drills. You would like, you know, throw 500, you know, free throws, right? Like to get good at it. Um, for me personally, uh, I think a couple of things that work is to collect stimuli and collect inspiration from like disparate places, right? Like, so I, I like listen to podcasts or, you know, read books. And I have to say the majority of the books I, I never finish. Um, like uh, this weekend, I took an online class on comedy by Steve Martin. And believe me, I have no intention to be a comedian, but I learned so much about his thought process. It was so interesting and things that I can then translate. Um, and then I think I, I obsess about the the projects that I'm working on, but but I I obs that but it's a, a an oscillating obsession. So basically, it goes in and out of consciousness. And I think that that going in and out is important. And sometimes you have to even force it. You have to step away. For me, I have to step away from the work uh, and go into a place where there's no inputs and no outputs and kind of like and the ideas are kind of like you know. Uh, swirling in my mind and forced to, you know, uh, combine, recombine in interesting ways. Um, so creating that space uh, for incubation um, is important to me and, and, and works for me. Yeah, I think uh, you're right, Ryan. We fundamentally believe in uh, a growth mindset that uh, anyone can acquire uh, cert, you know, certain capacity and capability, um, and it's our job to help students achieve that. And, and I think as it relates to our innovation fellows, we can see students who believe they're creative as well as students who do not believe they're creative. When we put them in a context with a, uh, a, a uh, you know, in a, in a fertile environment, for them to thrive, that they're going to find themselves um, being much more creative. And, uh, and, and I think that we, you know, a lot of times it's just about a sort of a mindset. And uh, part of our process is to help people adopt that mindset, a mindset where you're, uh, you're not fearing failure and you're okay with trying things, and you're okay with saying yes more rather than no, and filtering out um, the opportunity to try new things. And so we, for us, we help hundreds of students a year acquire these uh, mindsets uh, through a set of practices that we've figured out has worked. Um, the incentives and, and rewards of going through our, our training and then you know having them go in front of uh, university leaders, people they've never presented in front of who they're gonna present this case. And then um, one of the things Leticia alluded to it, bringing them to Stanford and having them hear from other students, fellows who 
went through the program just a year before who have themselves had these epiphanies of, um, you know, uh, trying things and, and uh, you know, acknowledging the imposter syndrome that one might feel or not feeling ready or feeling the pressure of, uh, of the, the weight of the world through, you know, their, their parents or their major, you know, all the baggage that we bring to this work, we call it out, right? We call it out and we acknowledge it. And then we put that behind us and, you know, just really urge students and really urge all people to just try things that you you in doing so you're exercising your ability and you're acquiring more creative confidence as it relates to whatever it is you might want to tackle and i think the same is true for you know uh, for people at work that we need to create culture a culture of pe where people are feel it's safe to take risks, calculated risks, not risks with millions of dollars, but to try things and having a more experimental approach. What's the worst that can happen? Um, and in doing so, uh, we can acquire a creative confidence in our ability to come up with ideas and try things that create value in our workplace. I love, I love all of that. I love all of that. Um, and I think, you know, getting to my last question, and then we'll jump quickly over to a lightning round from, from ones with the audience, because I think this one is something you both are very passionate about and have ha have touched on many times. Um, but I want to call it out. You know, the University Innovation Fellows Group is an incredibly diverse group, right? Um, it's not it's not just you know uh, engineering students. It is students of of all majors, right? It's students of all backgrounds. It's students from many countries. It's you know equally men and women. It's many different races. Um, I'd love to hear about you know, any tips or tricks you have? I mean, I think, you know, oftentimes in, in large organizations, you know, people struggle uh, and, and, you know, have a tough time. And we've seen it in the technology industry a lot, right? Where companies do not have very diverse workforces. Um, so would love to hear your thoughts, you know, because I know that is very, very important to both of you um, on, on how you've built that up over, over time. Well, um, we do a few things to help ensure that diversity. One thing we learned early on was that we, we're not like other student organizations on campus where you know it, it becomes a popularity contest to run for election and then hold a, you know, a role as the president of a club. Um, the students that we're attracting, you know, we're, we're not looking for those kinds of students. We're not looking for students who have an entrepreneurial venture or are looking at the startup hustle in their college environment. And, you know, they're, they're motivated by other things. Good things, that's fine. But we're looking at, for students who care about the education of their peers. And fundamentally, that's going to be a different kind of person. Someone who cares about others is going to be a different kind of person. So we see, uh, so that's one thing. We're, we're, we're drawing from a different population of people. The other thing that we found really works uh, is if you, you know, put out a wide casting call, you're going to get people who are, you know, come to the beauty pageant ready to show off. We're, we, we actually deter our campus leaders from having that kind of wide casting call approach. We prefer something a little bit more like the MacArthur Genius Award, where you don't even know who the panel of people are that are looking for certain attributes in others. And tapping that person on the shoulder and saying, you know, we think you've got something special. You know, we believe in you. We need you. We'd like you to work with us. And that kind of nomination approach, you know, you're gonna pick the, un, the, the you're not going to get the usual suspects. You're going to get people who are more diverse. And so I think there's something to that is, um, you know, in an industry setting to identify who are the people that care about others? Who are the people that are not going to aggressively go for the promotion of, you know, and, and like climb that corporate ladder? But they're the people who really care, will work their ass off. and. Uh, and so sometimes people just need to be given a chance. And people of color many times fall into that category, women. Um, and, and I think that if you, if you articulate 
a belief in people, you know, again, people rise to the bar that you set for them. So finding those individuals, setting a bar and being there for them, you're creating the conditions that allow for um, diverse populations to be successful. Yeah, and one thing to add is that uh, as, as we mentioned, uh, although we have a great home at the Stanford D School, we do not have a budget from Stanford to run this program. So we rely on the institutions who participate uh, to make it possible. Uh, and we can, uh, we feel that we need more minority serving institutions participating in the program. Uh, and, and oftentimes that's, you know, a, a struggle because there's many priorities for the schools. Um, and uh, oftentimes we have been able to uh, rely on, on partners who are, have the bold vision seeing past the traditional metrics, right? Like, uh, and just like, okay, is this program going to uh, increase graduation rates? Well, perhaps we cannot show a link, but perhaps there are more interesting, uh, you know, uh, impacts that we're creating. One example of that is when uh, Google a couple of years ago uh, approached us, and this was a particular program where they wanted to develop mobile developers or train mobile developers in India, but they also uh, had the bigger vision of saying like, well, but what if we you know, promoted innovation and entrepreneurship in the schools where the students who are going to be become the mobile developers uh, come out of. Um, and so we are going to end up with more innovative mobile developers that are, are uh, that can identify the problems that they should uh, be coding for, right? So Google very generously helped us expand our program into India. So uh, we feel that even if our program is, is quite diverse, there's more than we can do, um, and and we uh, we are always looking for those bold partners um, to do that. I love that. I love that. Um, yeah, and I think it's I think it's incredibly true for for today and in, in the world that we're in. So um, we've got a few questions. I'd love to do that. I know we've only got about five minutes left, so maybe let's quick hit a few of these ones because I know they're 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 going to be some good answers. So the top voted one was obviously about COVID nineteen. Um, so, you know, how is COVID-19, you know, going to impact higher education and, and how are the fellows currently addressing it? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, COVID-19 has affected, you know, uh, every institution uh, imaginable and, um, and, and higher ed is no uh, exception. As you know, a lot of students were sent home to do distance learning and immediately we found our uh, faculty and, and administration who haven't had to innovate, you know, many of them are innovators, but who many who haven't had to innovate have had to innovate overnight and uh, figure out how to teach their classes uh, online. Um, this is an incredible opportunity for it, um, for educators to be innovative in how they do that and not just lecture. Uh, we're not seeing that across the board, but we are seeing that. Um, and in students um, are, you know, we've had a lot of conversations with students who are all over the map. Um, some saying, you know, this is not what I signed up for. Um, I want the full college experience. And others saying, you know, uh, it's, it's completely understandable. It is a pandemic after all. And I've actually learned more and differently in an online environment uh, than ever before. I've had faculty and students alike say that they are on a equal playing field in a sense with their educators, that they're, you know, they're more eye to eye and connecting in a way that they weren't connecting necessarily in a classroom environment. Um, it's unclear to me what will happen, you know, five, 10 years out, um, but those are some of the, the early uh, trends that we're saying, seeing. And uh, um, Leticia, maybe you could tell us yeah. a little bit about UF versus Corona. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that we did uh, in April, um, you know, of course, like, you know, everyone is like teaching online and we could, you know, get on with the program and just translate our classes. But also, what if we actually, uh, you know, take all of the ingenuity of these young people uh, and, and directed at these big problems that, uh, that are, we're uh, faced uh, with, with the pandemic. So we created this uh, hybrid virtual incubator accelerator that we run for two weeks 
um, and, uh, and, and teams formed organically with fellows, fellows from different cohorts and faculty and, and other collaborators that we invited the fellows to bring. And they created distributed teams uh, tackling different challenges, all from, you know, um, you know, reactivating the economy, fighting the disease, reimagining education, protecting the most vulnerable, and different challenges within those categories. Um, and, and to this date, we have many teams that continue working on their projects, right? Like, so we created uh, real action um, from the part of, of these students. Um, another, um, and we are, we're hoping to, to write about it, uh, you know, we've been busy doing and, and not as so much time uh, in, in, in writing about it, but uh, hopefully soon. Uh, the other thing, and it might be a, a component of our program that is not as visible, uh, is that we have a workshop for university educators. And we have been doing this since 2016 uh, in person and helping them innovate in their teaching practices. And, and uh, in this coming uh, summer, we're doing a virtual uh, workshop and we have a, a group of educators who are very excited to get past that first kind of like, you know, reaction of like, oh, do, how do I do Zoom, right? Like, and the more kind of like uh, trivial things and more uninteresting things, I think now we're in the moment where we can start to like really challenge some of the basic assumptions of how we teach and how we learn. And hopefully many of those will impact in a positive way how we teach and learn beyond this situation of, uh, of being uh, sheltering in place, right? Like, so when schools reopen, hopefully many of these things will stay, but we need to work on this and, and, and we need to have that memory uh, of, you know, um, of the innovations that we're trying now, right? And fundamentally, yeah. I think we'll see just new models emerge, right? Because what is the value proposition that students really have of being in an in-person environment? And what are the ways in which, you know, online education um, and creating communities like this uh, will, will resonate? I, I think we'll see some things stick even after the pandemic is behind us. I love that. I love that. So I was looking through the questions that were submitted, and I think you all answered a good chunk of them, whether it's all around COVID or you know, preparing students for uncertain futures and those mindsets and, you know, how can organizations prepare for the next emergency and being open and those kind of things. So, so maybe with one minute left, I'll turn to, to the last question, which we ask every guest, um, which is if you have to think back to, to yourselves in, in, uh, in college, um, what advice would you give yourself? And maybe two sentences. Um, okay, I'm, I'm happy to, to start. Um, so I, I'd say, I would tell myself, uh, don't let your major, your discipline define you, okay? You fulfilled all of these required courses, you are getting a shiny diploma, that's great, but you are much more than that, okay? You are, your quirks, your passions, your side projects, the people that you spend time with, you have to value and nurture them because any and all of those are going to open doors that a diploma cannot, right? So go through those doors. That's what I would say. Yeah, um, I would say, uh, I would say life's not linear. <laughs> it's actually a video series I'm working on with a student um, where we're interviewing people who have come out of recessions and other such, you know, like, you know, layoffs and other such hard times, you know, you, you imagine a path from your degree to, you know, some future uh, aspirational goal for your, for your, your career, but actually, you know, the way you get there isn't always going to be a direct straight line. You're going to take some turns and you are going to learn some things about yourself and about the environment that you wanna be in and the kind of impact you wanna have in the world. And so you gotta be open to that. Otherwise you will have this constant struggle of, well, but this is what I imagined and, but I'm learning this. So like just really remaining open that life's not linear and allowing yourself to take the twists and turns that life is, is you know, you're blessed to have in life. I love both of those. All right, well, that's an amazing place to end on. Thank you so much, Humer and Leticia. I know all of our hundreds of guests that I can see on the line um, really, really got some amazing insights. And I think 
I think it's going to drive change beyond uh, beyond the universities into into many many different other fields. So thank you so much, and uh, thanks for everyone who came. We'll um, you know send out uh, you know this information and and more about the next event in June. Thank you, Ryan. Awesome. Thank, thank you so time. much. Take care. Bye. Everybody.